everyone. Well, here we are again, talking about the great return. This is the second part of a message I preached to you a little while ago. And I wanted to bring a, the fullness of Psalm 126 and to talk about it as the great return, the great rebuild, the great recovery in the context of us regaining lost ground through COVID. Some of us have lost a whole lot more than others. Some of us didn't lose much at all. It seems about half the population of most countries are seemingly okay. The other half have struggled and suffered badly. So I want to believe God with you for our people and our congregations, for our churches and for you individually, that there will definitely be a recovery, knowing that God Himself is a restorer. He redeems and restores. So to understand that whatever we have lost, He is going to bring it back. In fact, He put it in the Old Testament law that when a person lost things or somebody stole it, they had to return it to them, sometimes fourfold, sometimes sevenfold. It, it was not just a restoration, it was restoration plus, plus, plus. So we can anticipate that whatever has been lost will not only be recovered, but that we will see an increase in that recovery, not just of maybe a doubling, but of 10 timing, 10 timing what we have seen go out the door. We're going to believe God is going to bring back an immense recovery it's His house. Our churches are His. We are His. And so He looks after, He has that responsibility. He assumes that. He's not going to leave us to languish and to perish. He's going to recover and rebuild everything that's been lost. And all through the Bible, you will see how when the prodigal son returned, God restored to him everything he had lost in a second. He didn't wait like three months and say, let's just see if you're going to work out all right this time, boy. He said, quickly, put the robe on him. Quickly, put that ring on his finger. That's like getting an unlimited, top of the line American Express card in your hand with no authorization needed. Just bang, put it down, buy a house. Bang, put it down, buy a yacht or whatever. Their ring could be stamped into the clay anywhere. And this was a wealthy landowner, his father. He just said, and the, the clothing he put on him, the VIP clothing that was reserved for the, the best people who came his way. He put it immediately on his son as soon as he came back into the house. And then sandals on his feet. Servants didn't wear sandals, only sons. And, and it's interesting to me that in the, in the Old Testament, God said to Moses, take off your sandals. To others, he said, take off your sandals. In the New Testament, he puts the sandals on. Because in the Old Testament, you didn't have any standing except yourself before God. You stood barefoot before God on your merit, on your, that's, if you kept the law, you could do it, but nobody could. So you were just done. You, you needed those constant sacrifices always to forgive and cleanse and cover your sins. But in the New Testament, He gives us Christ's, Sandals, if you like. We're standing in Christ. We are standing in perfect righteousness before God. It's been imputed to us, accounted to our account and deposited in our account. We, we have the full righteousness, the fully perfect life of Jesus attributed to us. So He died as us so that we could live as Him in, in His righteousness. So powerful, the basic gospel message. And so God recovered that prodigal boy. In the, in, the, in the Old Testament, there's the story of the woman in 2 Kings 4 who, uh, who loses. I mean, she is, there's, there's two stories about widows. One is losing everything to the creditor because her husband left her in debt. And then there's the great woman who, who built room for Elisha in her house. God restored to both those women everything they lost. The, the woman who had the boy he died when, when he was about 12 years old, when he went to help his father in the field. And, and the woman went to the prophet and the prophet said, what's up? She says, oh, don't lie to me about me having a son after I was barren. You, you said you're going to have a son. Well, he's dead. He died. And so the prophet comes down and restores the boy back to life. 
a little later on, that same prophet tells the woman, you've got to leave the land because there's going to be a famine here. And she comes back to the land after seven years and coincidentally is just going to visit the king to talk about her land that she lost. And Gehazi, I hope I haven't lost you here, Gehazi, Elisha's servant, is telling the king about Elisha raising that boy from the dead for this woman. And he goes, whoa, there she is right here. And the king says, whoa, all the land that you lost when you went away from Israel into the land of the Philistines for seven years, it's all back. You can have it all back. And, uh, and all the income that you lost during that time from the land. Incredible. God arranges restoration. And as we come out of COVID and out of lockdowns and isolation and business difficulties and struggles, employment difficulties, I want you to know and believe with me for our people everywhere and our churches everywhere to experience that restoring power of God on our congregations, on our people, so that in the church, people can know, wow, God is alive in that place. He's doing things. And so it says when the Lord did this, we started to dream again. I love it. The next, the next verse says, our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. I, I got to tell you, when... When you laugh in the Holy Spirit, you get victory of all sorts of devils. Let me tell you, laughter is a medicine for wounded souls. If people are being wounded in this time, laughing together is awesome. And it's a good reason to have fellowship and to come back and to spend time together. Isolation. People don't laugh a lot on their own. And if they do, you wonder about their, their sanity. If you see somebody go, ha, 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 you're like laughing away on their own. It's a little weird. I'm, I don't say it's completely weird. It might happen every now and then. But, but when you see two people laughing together, you think, well, that's sanity. That's health. And a church that laughs a lot, loves a lot. No doubt about it. They're secure. They laugh themselves. They can laugh with others. And a sense of humor, I believe, is divine. I think God has a sense of humor. I think when He breathed into us, part of that breath is a sense of humor. Because I don't see animals telling each other jokes. Maybe, I don't know. No, I don't. I, you don't see them all, like one guy tells a joke and everybody ha, ha, laughs around. I mean, kookaburras sound like that's happened, but really? seeing the funny side of things, I'm sure it's a God, a God quality that humans have because of that spark of the divine, that spirit of the divine in all of us. So our mouths was filled with laughter when the Lord turned us around and started restoring us back to Jerusalem. And our tongue was singing, worshiping together in the house of God with hearing the voices of others feeling the presence of angels, experiencing that outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the presence of God being like a weight on your hands, the oil refreshing you, reinvigorating you in the presence of the Lord. It comes in worship. You've got to have times of extended worship in church life as people come back. Have altar calls with worship times on them. If you need to dismiss the service, do. But keep an altar call. Keep times when people can engage with God again. Feel that appetite, that hunger, that thirst for the Holy Spirit return. And that is the great return. That is the great reviving. Never let the devil steal your song. Keep the song alive in the church and in the individuals. And then they settle among the nations. The Lord has done great things for them. I so want this to happen, that the world looks at the church and says, wow, look at what God's doing for them. Seems like we get, we get a lot of knocks, we get a lot of criticism, but I'm believing that like in the New Testament, they took a lot of knocks, but they were also feared by the community, which means deeply revered and respected. And I, I have no doubt that the power of the church is returning. We will recover and be restored in that 
power of the Holy Spirit so that presence of God will linger on us. And instead of languishing, we'll be lingering in the presence of the Lord, holding fast to the, to the presence of God. And so never lose the song. And so then the psalmist recognized, he says, yeah, the Lord has done great things for us and we are glad. Guys, we got to get our heads out of the news cycle on television, on Twitter, on wherever we are getting the news from. That should not be the dominant influence on our thinking and perspective. We should be able to say the Lord's done some great things for us. <laughs> Rather than saying, oh, have you seen what they've done now? And you've seen what those, oh, it's hopeless what these guys are doing. Have you seen what this government's doing? You've seen what these guys are doing. I mean, it's all just complaining and outrage and offense and negativity. And if you live there, that's going to shape your spirit. So when you go to talk to your wife, you say, yeah, well, you, and you're, you're in that attitude. We've got to say to ourselves, the Lord has done great things for us. Write down a list of the great things the Lord has done for you. I look around here at church and think, God has done great things for us. And the first thing I'm looking at are, are the people in our church, the people that I am privileged to do life with, to journey with, magnificent, platinum-spirited people. Where else would I have had that? The Lord has done this. The buildings, the movement, all of our pastors, the tribe we're in. The Lord has done such an amazing thing. I love it when I hear pastors say, I'm so thankful to God for being in this crew and and being part of the team, because I know people, I know so many pastors who are just on their own. They, they don't have people who would die for them. They might have consultants or, you know, church advisors or, or go to a conference and there's some sort of level of fellowship, but not a sense of belonging. And I believe all of us need that. We, and, and there may be a price to it sometimes. It might be a little awkward and difficult now. We might get ego bruising or, you know, might be a little rough every now and then. It's like a family. It's worth it. It's the worth of it and the depth and the richness of the tapestry of relationships and the love that we experience, no matter how challenging it can get. Honestly, there are blessings on the other side of every trial that you, you got to go through the, the valley to get to that mountaintop. There's... There's, there's things that God has got for every one of us in the relationships, the destinies, that as we jigsaw together, we actually discover the picture that God has called us to, to accomplish together. It's a beautiful thing and a privilege. The Lord has done great things for us. C3, the Lord has done great, great things for us. And we are happy, Lord. We're glad. We're not complaining. We're not joyless and despairing. We're believing, full of hope and thanking God. We're not wishing we were someone else, somewhere else. Not hoping that we'll be like them or be like that one. I'm content. I'm happy. And I thank God for everything that He's given us and that we have. But I'm not content in, a, in an apathetic way. Where, oh, yeah, well, this is it. I'm satisfied with an unsatisfied satisfaction. I am content with the fire of God in me for, for more, for gr huge amount. But I'm not complaining about what we have. I just know there's a whole lot more for you and I where that God has got for us. Bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. He's talking about the streams in the desert and the riverbeds would be empty all winter. And then spring would come, melt the snow and flash floods would come down those riverbeds. Dangerous flash floods filling the place with water. The psalmist is saying, do that in restoration, Lord. Not something that takes 10 years and we gradually rebuild. Like a flash flood, like those streams in the, in, the, in the Negev, in the desert, in the south, rushing through those dry riverbeds. We are praying for a mighty inrushing of the Holy Spirit into your church, into your individual life into your business, into your connect group, into your family, that the blessing of God would come rushing back, bringing restoration 
Do it again, Lord. And here's the other thing that there is a translation that interprets that as do it again, Lord. And every year that would happen, obviously, when the snows would melt. But the do it again concept, I I love that because we read of revivals and things that God did in other places. And we think, wow, that was amazing. I think we should be praying, do it again, Lord. And I, let, me, let me say this to you. What he has done at other times, he can do it again. What he has done in other nations, he can do it right there where you are. What he has done for other people, he can do for you. He is no respecter of persons. God is as able to do what he's done for anybody anywhere in the world, in the history of the world, for you and me right here, right now. God is alive. He's not unwell. He's not sick. Hasn't even got a cough. He doesn't get old. And he's the same. He has got the same power that he's always had. Regardless of what we might read, you know, that things have passed, gifts have passed to that. God's the same. Same God, same power, same Jesus Christ. You and I can access him through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the work of the cross and see him Do it again in our world, in Jesus' name. Then he says, those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. I'm so proud of you guys. I am so proud of you because you've kept on going when others might have found it too difficult. You have kept sowing. You have kept doing what God has called you to do, even though it's been through a time of tears time of pain, sadness, sorrow, but you kept sowing. You didn't pull out. You didn't drop out of the race. Those who sow in tears, you can't keep sowing and not reap. You can't keep praying and not get an answer. Sowing, there comes, I mean, every trial has an end, people. You can't keep going through a trial and it never, you never get into what that trial is meant to be accomplishing. It's going to accomplish something. And God has blessing, and favor for you and rewards for your world, for you. In Jesus' name, you will reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless, without a doubt, you will come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. When God restores, we come again. What we lost, We recover ground. He returns the years that the worm has eaten. And so whatever grief, whatever we've lost in times of grief, we can see it recover. Think of Job. Lost everything, went through a terrible time of grief. In the end, God restored everything he had lost. Think of of other people through Scripture like the prodigal son lost everything through his own fault. Job's case, it didn't seem so much like that. Certainly wasn't like that. But in the prodigal said, it's completely his fault. He he came back saying, I'm unworthy. God wouldn't hear a bar of that. He said, no, you're my son. He said, I just want to be a servant. He said, your relationship to me is son. And you're fully restored into that relationship. He could say, well, it's my stupid mistake. Of course it is. It's all our stupid mistakes that we end up. But that doesn't disqualify us from his restorative power. That does not prevent us from accessing redeeming grace and the power of God to reinstate us. He is for you. He's not against you. He is good. He is not bad. He's kind. He's not capricious. And God is going to come into your world recovering and reviving things that have been lost, things that have died. And I'm believing that this will be the great rebuild. We won't just recover to be recovered or be revived to be revived. We are revived for a purpose. And the purpose that these people experienced in Psalm 126, they were revived, they were recovered, they were restored. Why? So they could rebuild. They went back to Jerusalem and they started rebuilding. The story is long, too long for this session as well, but they had to clear the rubble. took 14 years. Haggai and Zechariah came in to encourage them because they got so discouraged and as they tried to rebuild, couldn't find the teams, couldn't find the people. 
but they had a revival. Ezra got involved, read the scripture to the people. That revived them. They got enthused. They felt the power of God. So they kept various feasts and festivals and then they cleansed themselves from unholy alliances and unclean practices and the worship of false gods that they that, that started to do with the people who had been left in Jerusalem. And once they cleaned it up a bit, then the Holy Spirit moved amongst them and they, they began to re- revive and then they rebuilt. And they rebuilt in unity, shoulder to shoulder. You read in Nehemiah, these guys built along this part of the wall, next to them were these guys, next to them were these guys, next to them were the bankers, next to them were the perfumers, next to them were the, the sword makers, next to them were all these different professions joined together in one grand purpose to build the church. The great rebuild happened in miraculous time. They rebuilt that wall, 52 days. Nehemiah accomplished it. When we come into unity, when we come into, into working together and with the, the grand purpose of building the church, God is going to do a swifter work than we ever imagined. Lord, I pray today that you'll empower every leader, every believer, every worker with the grace of God to build your church in Jesus' name. God bless you.